Los Angeles AGA Morant grabbed a seat in the gymnasium bleachers at a Los Angeles area high school following practice with the Memphis Grizzlies on Monday afternoon. It was a rare moment when he was not in motion. A rookie point guard, he tends to play with the smooth, relentless rhythm of ocean surf. Morant just keeps coming a at defenders, at the basket, at the lofty standards he sets for himself a and he has already done a good deal to validate the grizzly assault selection of him with the number two pick in the NBA draft. Entering Saturday OS game against the Phoenix Suns, he averaged 17.5 points and 5 assists while shooting 50% from the field and 42.9% from three-point range. But as fast as he plays, and as seamlessly as he has made the transition from Murray State to the NBA, Morant is still absorbing some of the most fundamental lessons about life in the league. Near the top of that list, the schedule seldom slows. Game after game. Road trip after road trip. Tough assignment after tough assignment. A just how quickly you need to turn the page, A. Morant said. A. You can't worry about the last game so much, because you are always moving on to the next one A. After years of gritting and grinding behind two players who became synonymous with the city of Memphis A. Mike Conley, now with Utah, and Mark Gasol, now with Toronto, A. The Grizzlies are recalibrating for the long haul behind a new tandem featuring Morant, 20, and a second year forward, Jaron Jackson Jr. There will, of course, be growing pains along with tantalizing glimpses of the future. Consider the wild three-day stretch that Morant and his teammates had at the start of the week. It began Sunday with an overtime home win against the Nets. Morant blocked a jump shot by Kyrie Irving at the end of regulation, then shoveled a pass to Jay Crowder for the game-winning three-pointer in overtime. Morant finished with 30 points and 9 assists while shooting 13 of 22 from the field. On Monday, the Grizzlies flew across the country to Los Angeles, then went straight from the airport to a nearby high school so they could practice for about an hour. Afterward, Morant took a few minutes to reflect on his work against the Nets. For years, he has graded each of his games. Against the Nets, he gave himself a 7 out of 10. He was upset about his six turnovers, he said, and he felt he had forced a few shots. A I did not like that part of my game, A he said. A I did feel like I competed well A. By Tuesday, though, Morant had moved on A in part because he had no choice. In California will not lead directly to worse wildfires. But California is the fifth largest economy in the world, and what happens here can reverberate and affect national and international efforts to halt global warming. The past 10 days have brought home to many Californians the brutal reality of a changing climate and cemented the feeling that politicians far away in Washington are not just ignoring it but actively working to undermine their efforts to address it. The seas are rising, diseases are spreading, fires are burning, hundreds of thousands of people are leaving their homes, Jerry Brown, the former California governor, told a hearing in Washington earlier this week. California is burning while the deniers fight the standards that can help us all. This is life and death stuff, he said. The images of the wildfires beamed around the world barely begin to capture the grinding frustration of California residents at home. In wine country, two hours north of San Francisco, Mike and Debbie Bailey watched helplessly night after night last week as the mountain across from their ranch was on fire again. The same hills burned two years ago. Like many in Northern California, the Baileys, who defied evacuation orders to protect their home and their animals, faced the double threat of fires and a power company that turned off their electricity, disabling their water pumps. Mr. Bailey, a retired pharmacist who has metastatic prostate cancer, missed five days of radiation treatment. I've reached my limit, he said on Thursday as the fire was being brought under control. This is the climate change that scientists have been telling us about for years and we've buried our heads like ostriches. The most destructive, the deadliest and the largest wildfires in California history have all occurred in the past two years. The Camp Fire, which incinerated the town of Paradise in the Sierra foothills, 
killed 86 people and destroyed nearly 19,000 homes. A year earlier, the Wine Country fires killed more than 40 people and destroyed more than 5,000 homes. The Mendocino Complex fire last year, which burned 460,000 acres, was the largest ever recorded in the state. The trauma of these fires has kept Californians in a heightened state of vigilance, sniffing the air for smoke, scanning hilltops for any signs of ignition. Amid widespread anxiety there are some reasons to be hopeful so far this year. Although the state's fire agency has recorded about 5,000 fires this year in the area it oversees about the same as during the same period last year, far fewer acres have burned, less than 100,000 compared with about 600,000 at this point last year. But the number of people affected this year swelled into the millions because of the large-scale power outages that Pacific Gas and Electric, the state's largest utility, carried out to prevent downed lines and other equipment from sparking fires. In the back of your mind there's that constant fear that the power could go out again, said Amanda Baston, who lives in a camping trailer because her home was damaged in the campfire and is still being rebuilt. Her power has been shut off four times so far this year. It's devastating the emotions that are wrapped up around this whole situation, she said. Particularly frustrating is a realization for many California residents that both fires and the blackouts will return. The chief executive of Pacific Gas and Electric, William D. Johnson, said recently that the deliberate blackouts would be necessary for the next decade. But some experts believe they could become a fixture of life in California for much longer. Michael Wara, director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program at Stanford University, says the extreme winds that are knocking down power lines and starting fires are only one factor. The conditions that we are observing right now are a function of climate change and climate change will get worse, he said. California has contended for over a century with an annual wildfire season. But scientists have found that climate change including longer, hotter and drier fire seasons, diminishing snowpack and lengthening droughts have already measurably worsened the size and scale of fires in the western United States. Hotter temperatures means drier vegetation, making it more likely to burn. The 2018 National Climate Assessment, a major scientific report produced by 13 federal agencies, concluded that if greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels continue to increase at current rates, the frequency of severe fires in the West could triple. The report noted that climate change will also bring more specific threats to California. Increased drought could devastate the state's farmers, warming waters could close fisheries and spur the growth of toxic algae, and rising seas could inundate the homes of 200,000 Californians and erode two-thirds of California beaches by 2100. The Trump administration moved this summer to eliminate California's authority under the Clean Air Act to set standards on planet-warming tailpipe pollution that are stricter than those set by the federal government. When California officials struck a deal in July with four automakers to abide by the state's tougher standards, the EPA formally revoked California's authority, prompting a lawsuit. The Trump administration has also threatened to withhold highway funding opened an antitrust investigation into California's deal with the carmakers and filed suit to block part of a state initiative to limit greenhouse gases from power plants, arguing that its regional cap-and-trade system was unlawful because it included Quebec, Canada. Why are they going out of their way to attack this authority now, asked Daniel Lashoff, director of the World Resources Institute, a research organization focused on environmental policy adding that California has been working with Quebec for over a decade. The lawsuit against California could slow the spread of such programs. And if the courts back the Trump administration in the fight over auto pollution standards, 13 other states that have adopted California's stricter standards would also be forced to abandon them.